Hello, this is Dr. J, back with some more Let's Play Command & Conquer. We are now here on Nod Mission 4. I believe this is the first of the branching paths where it's actually two completely different missions instead of just two different maps for the same mission. We are now pressing into Chad. GDI is evacuating the village of Oham Hajir. Nod Command Directive. Destroy village and terminate GDI rescue operations. Search and destroy residual GDI presence. Okay, so, we're not really given any wider context, just that we are sabotaging a GDI effort to evacuate some civilians. Now, this is another pre-deployed mission, the first we've had since Nod Mission 1, I believe. The thing with the Command & Conquer pre-deployed missions, I do enjoy them. I think that they're good variety from the base building missions, and it's sort of a very different mode of play when you're playing with a limited number of units that you cannot replace. So I quite like them. However, in the case of the original Command & Conquer, the design on the pre-deployed missions is sometimes a little bit questionable in that you'll have these branching paths in the mission map with no real indication of which way to go, which would be fine, except sometimes if you choose the wrong way, then you pretty much just die. You just encounter undefeatable enemy forces and you get wiped out. And there's basically no way to know which way to go, so if that happens, you just have to restart the mission and go a different direction. In my opinion, that's not the best mission design, but it's not too big a deal. These are generally pretty short, so it's not a huge problem if you end up having to restart from the beginning. Or you can safe scum your way through, but that's lame. You may also notice that I have slightly decreased the resolution that I'm playing at. I decided that it was a little too large before, to the extent that it was kind of hard to even see what was going on a lot of the time. It's still a pretty large resolution, but hopefully a little bit more manageable. Hopefully this is a good compromise between battlefield awareness and being able to actually have a sufficiently zoomed in view that we can see what the heck is going on. Also, we are getting absolutely wrecked. This is going quite poorly for us. So, it's looking like we might not complete this mission on the first try, given that we have almost no units left. Alright, here is the village that I suppose GDI is trying to evacuate. If we check our mission objectives, intercept the convoy and destroy it. Okay, so, it is imperative that the villagers be totally destroyed. Let's increase the game speed a bit, so we don't have to spend forever just sitting here watching our forces attacking these buildings. Not a whole lot to say as we watch our forces destroying these civilian buildings. It is a very nice feature that you can change the game speed. Speed it up for when you're doing mop-up operations or just destroying villagers that can't fight back. Some people like to play on the fastest speed all the time, but I dislike that. Uh, it's basically impossible to have any kind of micromanagement control if you're playing at the fastest speed. I prefer to be able to keep a little bit of a handle on my units. Alright, another one here, trying to hide behind this tree. I'll go ahead and create a save, just in case that was the last one. But it appears that it was not. Ah, there's more buildings down here. Exciting stuff, I know. 
destroying these civilian buildings that can't even fight back. Oh, there's an APC! Okay, and we lost our only anti-infantry unit, which is probably going to be make it ridiculously hard to finish the rest of the mission. So let's reload. This time, knowing that APC is there, we will lead with the attack bikes. Okay, and it was carrying a bunch of civilians. Why it wasn't evacuating them and was just sitting there is anybody's guess. Maybe the AI bugged out. GDI sure didn't serve those civilians well, though, did they? This is what I meant, though, when I said that the story in this game is very much just a depiction of not evil GDI good, as GDI is attempting to save these civilians, and we are just flagrantly destroying them all. The briefing didn't get, really give us any context for why any of this is happening. Which is a bit of a shame. It would be good to know the situation surrounding all this. But oh well. The briefing was also the first example of when... Track is so loud. Why does it keep selecting the really loud tracks? That briefing was the first... Oh, okay, we're done. All right, and it looks like there is no post-mission video this time, so I will see you for the other Nod Mission 4. Be right back. Okay, we're back, and now time to pick the other variation of this mission. GDI escalating now civil war. Nod factions require reinforcement. Nod command directive. Aid Nod supporters defense against GDI incursion. Eliminate GDI presence in the region. I have absolutely no idea what that cutscene we just saw has to do with anything. It appears to be completely unrelated to our mission, so that's very random. Let's go ahead and reduce the game speed back to one notch above center. And as I was trying to say at the end of the last mission, uh, those briefings are the first example we see of where instead of getting our mission objectives from our superior officer, uh, instead, Eva, the electronic video agent computer voice, is essentially the one who just gives us the mission. Now, it may seem strange that GDI and Nod are both using the same AI assistant, but I think the lore for that is that it was developed by GDI, or probably some kind of defense contractor at the behest of GDI, and that Nod managed to steal the technology and is essentially using a stolen pirated version of the EVA technology for their own purposes. Which is kind of amusing in its way. It's a rather funny bit of lore. In addition to being traditional terrorists, Nod are also a bunch of cyber pirates. Which is exactly what you would expect of an organization like Nod. All right, this river is very cleverly blocking our path southward. And recon bikes are still completely worthless against infantry. 
the Command and Conquer games have a little bit of a rock, paper, scissors mechanic going where explosive weapons, or I guess more accurately, anti armor weapons, are pretty worthless against infantry. Otherwise, if it weren't for that, you would basically just build tanks all the time and not really have much reason to use anything else if they were effective against infantry. And often you end up building almost nothing but tanks anyway, because they're still the most powerful unit in the game, despite these balancing attempts. So GDI seems to be attacking a civilian village here. But... If these villagers are harboring and supporting Nod terrorists, perhaps that justifies their actions. It does seem a little bit evil on GDI's part, though. Lost my train of thought. Oh right, I was talking about the rock-paper-scissors mechanic. It does look a little bit silly when things like rockets and tank shells are slamming infantry right in the face and the infantry are barely taking any damage from it. So it makes sense from a game balance perspective, and there's even some real-world uh, realism to it. Tank armor unsupported by infantry actually are vulnerable to infantry ambushes. So it is legitimately the case that uh, just a big column of armor that doesn't have any kind of support is vulnerable to that kind of thing. It is just that the way it's depicted in-game can often be very silly looking. Was that Humvee really just ignoring us until we decided to attack it? Alright, now that we've defended our friendly Nod-supporting village, it's time to go destroy the enemy GDI-supporting village. Which is apparently up here in the opposite corner of the map. Oh, we've got an enemy APC here. Fortunately, we have rocket soldiers who are good anti-armor units. Pretty serious battle going on in this village here. Actually, it's going very poorly for us because we've basically lost almost all of our anti-infantry units. And there's still some enemy grenadiers left. Well, no, now it's just minigunners. Okay, no, I was wrong, it is Grenadiers. It's so hard to tell, the resolution. Okay. If that's it for the enemy infantry, then now we can mop up. No, it's not it for the enemy infantry. And there's an enemy medium tank. I think we've lost this mission. Yeah, it's looking very grim for us. Okay, well, we have to restart. This is definitely our loss. Okay, we have a better idea what we're up against this time. Uh, let's actually try to separate our anti-armor and anti-infantry a little better. Man, I might have to reduce the resolution even further. It is still difficult to see what's going on, even at just 1024 by 768. We can go all the way down to 800 by 600 if we have to. I mean, we could go even lower than that, but why would we? Oh, enemy Humvee here. Okay, once again, first order of business is to go save the friendly village in the southeast. That guy hiding behind the tree managed to ambush me twice. Okay, enough of these really heavy, intrusive tracks, seriously. Let's go with a nice uh, Counter-Strike track. Those are very atmospheric and kind of low-key. Yes, I actually really like the tracks that got added with the Counter-Strike expansion. Okay, there's the enemy medium tank. I'd rather have him attacking the infantry due to the rock paper. Okay, not if he's going to squish him, though. Get the anti-armor squad in here. Run, he'll squish us. Okay, I wanted the whole anti-armor squad in on this. It wasn't really, you know, just those of you who feel like it. Okay. And now they're going to be helpless against the minigunner who came out, so we need to go finish him off. If you please. Okay, we need to intercept these guys, actually. Alright, whatever. Whatever. 
Okay. This is going better. I know it's a little safe scummy, but I'm going to go ahead and make a save here. I'm relying pretty heavily on the G key to attack enemy infantry formations because it's so hard to click on them at this tiny resolution. Oh, there's a Humvee who was foolish enough to attack the entire armor squad. Oh, but then he was smart enough to run away. I have quite a few minigunners who aren't part of my control groups. They must have come out of destroyed vehicles. Okay, we cannot afford to lose all our anti-infantry again. Okay, that enemy APC had a bunch of grenadiers in it. This is very not ideal. Alright. Is the situation under control? Kill that civilian. Okay, get, get the enemy infantry. They are a much bigger threat. Come on, guys. This is what I'm talking about, where it looks very silly. Where infantry just eat huge volleys of rockets to the face and just shrug it off. Oh man, a squad of grenadiers? Am I going to lose again? Okay, I still have enough anti-infantry we're dealing with the grenadiers. These pre-deployed missions are some of the hardest in the game, generally speaking. Your inability to replenish your units is a real handicap. I think we've got the situation under control now. Alright, how many civilian buildings are left? Scout out the town. Okay, you guys will engage in friendly fire at pretty frequent intervals. I'm feeling secure enough to up the game speed a bit. Get that civilian. And that one. Actually, that almost looked like it might have been an enemy infantryman. Yeah, there's GDI infantry hiding in some of these buildings. Okay, I think this is the last building, so let's make a save here. Though I don't believe the next uh, mission branches, and I am planning to just go straight on to the next mission uh, for sake of video length, so I don't think it'll be that critical that we have that save. Okay, mission's not over after all. Oh, is there a survivor hiding behind this tree? A civilian building hiding behind the tree. A whole bunch of them! I just hadn't scrolled far enough to the left. How foolish of me. And we just blew up the church. What evil swine we are. And the village well. We can't forget to destroy that. What's the game speed at? Okay, we've got it there, that's fine. Okay, now let's make our save, just in case. As I said, I don't think we'll need it, but... Better to make it and not need it than to want it and not have it, right? Mission accomplished. No! Mission's still not accomplished, okay? What's hiding from us now? We've got an enemy Humvee. Do we have to wipe out everything on the map? Use cursor location to see if we missed anything up in the village. Ah, there's one civilian! I couldn't see him because of the resolution! Man, I really might try bumping it down to 800 by 600 for the next video. I, I just cannot see. 
Alright, we finally got him. Well, so-and-so tried to blend him with the sand, but it didn't save him. Ridiculously loud explosion as usual. Alright, onward to Nod Mission 5. This will be the last mission of this video. And then we're going to move back on to GDI for a couple missions. It will be a narratively appropriate point to do so. Still putting up with the weird buggy map screens. That is unfortunate because they're quite atmospheric, but the atmosphere is ruined a little bit by all the crazy lag. That is one long jumping arrow. To Mauritania. Before you can truly shape the future, you must first possess the past. Assimilate our history, for it is your own. Kane wants you to view this. Accessing Brotherhood Archives. The Brotherhood desires a world of peace, unity, and eternal brotherhood. The Brotherhood springs from the lowest of places, offering unity and peace to otherwise neglected and abused nations. Tiberium heralds the dawn of a new age. The Brotherhood embraces this age, harvesting Tiberium to further expand our collective beliefs. Tiberium continues to confound the scientific community, soaking up ground minerals and soil nutrients like a sponge. The end result of this unique leaching process creates the formation of Tiberium crystals, rich in precious metals and available for collection with a minimum of mining expense. I have good news. While I was at a top-level briefing with Kane, I made mention of your accomplishments and efforts. He's somewhat impressed, and is interested to see how you handle your next assignment. Kane needs Niger, and his personal commander is massing an assault through Algeria. We need to be assured that GDI's A-10 Warthogs flying out of Lagos do not hinder his progress. Your goal is to set up surface-to-air missile batteries and destroy the GDI airbase. You have caught Kane's eye, and he is watching. Do not fail me. Okay, a couple of things to bring up there before we dive into the mission. First of all, we finally get a little bit of backstory on Nod, and there we do get the implication that Nod sort of operates by offering empowerment to impoverished and oppressed peoples, as that little briefing clip told us. It is unfortunate that the vast majority of the story really doesn't depict this in any meaningful way. And it also explained that Nod believes Tiberium is the way of the future, and sort of explained that Tiberium leaches existing minerals and nutrients to create a strange and extremely valuable alien crystal which is all very mysterious, and if you think about the implications, a little bit alarming. Secondly, I do like the implication that Seth kind of put his neck out for us and mentioned our accomplishments to Kane, and as a result, Kane has decided to task us with a particularly important mission, and that Seth seems a little nervous and really hopes that we don't mess it up, because if we do, after he personally recommended us, then he would look bad in the eyes of Kane. It's a subtle thing, but I do like that little bit of kind of storytelling and uh, just implication of some of the Brotherhood politics. If we just check the text description of our objectives. Our brothers within GDI. Oh, I like that. This wasn't even mentioned in the video briefing, but apparently that means we have spies within GDI itself. A-10 strike jets scheduled to be deployed here soon. Our supp suppliers have delivered new SAM missiles. Well, that's redundant. Surface-to-air missile missile. Uh, to aid you, use the SAMs to defend your base, then seek out their base and destroy it. So really, this is actually just a standard destroy all enemies mission, except you also have to build a surface-to-air missile battery. And it might seem like, aside from the fact that you have to to complete the mission, 
that you really want to, because the enemy is going to be airstriking us, and the airstrikes are annoying. However, as we'll see, the surface-to-air missile batteries are actually not very effective at shooting down the enemy's warthogs. In fact, they're actually pretty useless for doing that, which is unfortunate. The way the SAMs are programmed in this game, they're effective against the enemy's vertical takeoff and landing craft, the Orcas, which we'll see much later. But they are basically worthless against the airstrikes. Which is kind of stupid, because you would think that being good against the airstrikes is exactly what they should be purpose-built to do. Once we switch over to the next GDI mission, we will see why I think it's narratively appropriate for after this mission to be a breakpoint. Man, it is so hard to click at this resolution. I really am going to try bumping it down to 800 by 600 and see how I like that. Now there is a bug in this game where the airstrikes, instead of being targeted intelligently, intelligently will just target whatever your northernmost unit is on the map at the time when the airstrike spawns. Which you can obviously really exploit to cause the airstrikes to target completely worthless things. Now there was a patch at some point that supposedly fixed that, and it was legitimately fixed in the remaster. However, I'm pretty sure that all the original patches that were supposed to fix that bug actually don't. So I'm pretty sure that the uh, airstrikes will still be bugged for this mission, and in fact this entire campaign and playthrough. We will go ahead and exploit that, because why not? We can now build airstrips, which means we'll be able to order vehicles. I don't think that we get any cool vehicles yet, but we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember every tiny little detail, like what vehicles we get when. I mean, sometimes I remember when we get certain units, but not each and every one. Alright, we took out that Grenadier. Do a little more scouting. The maps are slowly getting larger. The maximum map size in the original Command & Conquer is still fairly small, although big enough to have pretty large, interesting battles. The maximum map size grew quite a bit for Red Alert and especially for the Aftermath expansion, which increased the maximum size to, I think, 126 by 126 and called them Mega Maps. What can we build? Nothing good, I reckon? I am wrong! We can build light tanks! We go straight from not being able to build any vehicles to being able to build light tanks, which is sort of Nod's staple armor, and is a legitimately good unit. However, we're going to start out by building some Nod buggies for anti-infantry purposes, because the AI loves to use lots of infantry. Now you can micromanage or micro your units against grenadiers, because the grenades travel so slow and there is a wind-up time that if you want to, you can try to dodge them. It's not always worth it, but in cases like this it can be. Drastically reduce the amount of damage that your units will take. Alright, let's go ahead and retreat at this point. You'll notice that when you deploy the comm center, in addition to providing you with a mini-map, and later on we'll be able to build additional units because it's part of the tech tree, that it reveals a large amount of fog of war around it. So strategic deploying of the comm center can actually be a form of scouting, a limited form of scouting around your base. Let's lure the enemy into the Tiberium and let them take a pile of damage that way. Excellent. Alright, another... One more buggy and then we'll start churning out the light tanks. You won't see me making too much generalized use of recon bikes. They do tend to take a fair amount of micro to use well in most situations. I may sometimes use them for harvester hunting. They can be very effective for that. And they are a fast moving anti-air unit. So, oh, here we go. And as expected, it's targeting the northernmost unit. And it just took out a single uh, single attack buggy, which is not a big deal. Uh, when the enemy gets uh, Orcas, their vertical takeoff and landing 
air units, I will use recon bikes as mobile anti-air units, but they are, unless you really want to micro like crazy, they are too fragile to be useful for pitched battles, so they will not be a mainstay unit for me. Primarily light tanks and, oh, interesting. What is this Chinook dropping off? Primarily light tanks with a little bit of attack buggy backup for dealing with infantry are going to be my mainstays. Until we get access to a certain really awesome nod unit later in the campaign, which will then replace the attack buggies for anti-infantry purposes. But that doesn't come until pretty late in the campaign. Alright, so we've got an infantry squad coming down for us. I'll build a few infantry to deal with that. Little, uh, little quirk that we just saw. If you start building a unit when you don't have enough money to get even one tick of production on it, it just starts off on hold, and you have to manually click it again to get it off hold even when you have enough money to start building it. Which kind of strikes me as a bug, uh, so it's something we'll have to watch out for. And speaking of bugs, the way his turret is spastically moving around, it seems that that light tank is bugging out. We will go save him from his predicament with death. Salvation through destruction seems like the nod way. And actually, speaking of harvester hunting operations, let's go ahead and send these recon bikes in to harass the enemy harvester for exactly that purpose. Now attacking enemy harvesters typically makes the AI go berserk and will cause basically all of its units to come try to sort us out. So you don't want to do it until you're ready to deal with the enemy's entire army. As we can see here. However, it is, if you can repeatedly destroy the enemy's harvesters, a good way to wage economic warfare and starve them out. Alright, the enemy is responding with a lot of infantry. We're down to just two attack buggies because they're so fragile. Also, that was a friendly... Okay, we have three attack buggies, never mind. Okay, so we've got quite the battle going on here. As you can see, our tanks are not very well suited to dealing with enemy infantry. We can try to squash them, but it's a little unreliable, especially when the enemy engages in active squash dodging maneuvers. And it looks like all of our attack buggies have been destroyed once again. The reason that light tanks are so good is because they actually have some durability. Whereas the vast majority of Nod units are basically made of paper mache and get destroyed really fast. Being made of heavy armor and having a reasonable number of hit points is just incredibly valuable in this game. Other units have a tendency to just really get destroyed quickly once a major battle breaks out. So now I'm doing a little bit of scouting, checking out the terrain. Clearly the enemy base is located in here. Oh, I still haven't built a surface air missile battery, have I? We need to do that in order to complete the mission. This looks like a back door into the enemy base, and what do you know? That looks like their construction yard is extremely vulnerable to an engineer drop. Let us exploit that vulnerability, shall we? Sometimes there are useful rear entrances like this if you take the opportunity to scout around. Oh, and their uh, war factory, or excuse me, weapon factory, it is called a war factory in Red Alert, it is also incredibly vulnerable. Oh, the warthog is going for our light tank, because it is the uppermost leftmost unit of ours on the map. Napalm charges aren't that effective against heavy armor, so it didn't really accomplish much. Our SAM site is ready to go. We build it because we have to. Building. Even if the enemy A-10 were to attack our base, the SAM site would be useless in trying to stop it. 
It's because they have to pop up out of the ground to attack, which looks really cool. But the long delay means that by the time they've opened fire, the enemy's planes are pretty much already napalming your base. Looks like the enemy isn't replacing their harvesters, so we must have already crippled their economy. Looks like maybe another side entrance into the enemy base. I hear firing. What just happened? Not sure. Now, in Red Alert, there is an undocumented command called Q Move, where if you hold down the Q key and then click a bunch of times, uh, you can sort of set up waypoints for your units to follow. Oh, that, those are enemy infantry. Uh, let's send in a buggy to sort them out so that they don't kill our engineers. And I would be using Q-Move to set waypoints for my engineers and not have to micromanage them so that they don't go across the Tiberium and get killed. However, there is no Q-Move in the original Command & Conquer, so that is not an option. Alright, let's... Take care of these infantry and then move in our NGs. I'm going to pre-build a structure, namely a barracks, in preparation for building right next to the enemy buildings after we take them over. So a power plant. Oh, we do not want our engineers to be the northernmost units for the next airstrike, so let's move something else to be farther north than them. And there's some Tiberium silos to hold funds for after we begin infiltrating the enemy base. Let's pre-build another engineer too. Construction complete. Tactics, you see. Building. Even this early in the game, it doesn't hurt to use tactics instead of just brute forcing everything. More interesting, in my opinion, than just building a giant tank army and bulldozering over everything, which is a completely viable tactic, and sometimes it's the best tactic, but it's not the most interesting one, especially if you just do it over and over again. Okay, we need we need these sandbags to go so that we can build a barracks there. Plop down... Oh, I was going to pre-build an engineer, and I forgot to put him on hold. Whatever. I don't think we really need this construction yard. Let's build some flamethrowers and torch the enemies. And begin taking over their entire base. Excuse me, flamethrowers. Now, if we take over the enemy's silos, we should get quite a bit of money. Okay, we got no money whatsoever. Maybe the next silo will have some. It is a little buggy. Haha, <laughs> buggy, get it. Uh, capturing enemy silos. Sometimes they give you tons of money, sometimes they give you none whatsoever. It's finicky. Okay, that time we seem to get some money. One more to go. Oh, uh, you know what? He might wander... Yeah, we don't want him wandering into the enemy's guard tower. Let's just charge a guard tower, destroy it. Actually, our current forces would probably lose. Let's, let's just bust in with this tank army. Enough fooling around. Alright, let's squish these infantry. Ah, the game squish sound effect is so great. Now, flamethrowers are a dangerous unit to use because they have a tendency to flame your own forces a lot. But they are very effective anti-structure and anti-infantry forces. We are pretty close to being done with this mission, so let's make a save here.
And we could have built Humvees and APCs out of the weapon factory that we captured, but why bother? Mission accomplished. And that's our victory. Our SAM sites did no such thing, because the SAM sites are ineffective against enemy airplanes. They will prove better against orcas if the enemy ever bothers to attack our bases with orcas, but generally the AI uses orcas defensively instead of offensively, so we are not likely to ever really need SAM sites in this game. Recon bikes and possibly rocket soldiers will be our anti-aircraft weapons of choice. Anyway, that will certainly do it for this video. It's been more than long enough at this point. Next time, we'll be hopping back to the GDI campaign for a couple of missions. Hopefully you'll join me for that, and I'll see you then.